Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today for our session, Advocacy in Action, Driving Towards Caregiver Sustainability. Before we officially kick off the session, there are just a few housekeeping slides that we'd like to review. Um, so you can take us to the next slide. So today, um, our session is available in Spanish. To listen to this presentation in Spanish, please click the globe interpretation icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen and select your language. This session also has closed captioning available. To enable this, please click on the closed captioning icon at the bottom of your screen. You can also use the Zoom feature to chat, to share comments, reactions, and links with your fellow attendees and panelists. During today's session, we will have time for Q&A, so please submit any questions you have using the Zoom Q&A button found at the bottom. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, and before um, I hand it off, we do like to ground ourselves in our practice agreements, which are um, be present, be accountable, feel no pressure to speak, yes, yet resist the temptation to stay silent, be brave, be inclusive, our values, cultural identities, and personal experiences matter. Recognize that conflict is always possible and is okay. Take space, make space, call attention to people's unheard voices, ensuring that all individuals have space to fully participate. And lastly, address racially biased systems and norms. Call out power dynamics, recognize personal biases, and consider how they might impact action. Avoid becoming defensive when Black, Brown, or Indigenous folks speak from lived experiences with racism. Now I can officially pass it off to Drell, who is our moderator for today. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it is so good to be here. Uh, my name is Darrell Brooks, and I'm the founder and CEO of Love and Justice Consulting, an organization that provides leaders with diversity and social justice learning opportunities. And I just wanted to take an opportunity to welcome you to this incredible panel that we have today, um, Advocacy in Action, Driving Towards Caregiver Sustainability. Uh, and so uh, for our time today, um, it is really an, a great opportunity to uh, get questions answered. So as folks are sort of given their wisdom, their knowledge and experiences, uh, we really do encourage you to ask us some questions uh, as we begin to move through our time together. And so with that being said, uh, what we're gonna do is uh, our time is we're gonna uh, have some reactions. Um, as we saw in the beautiful presentation um, in the keynote uh, about all of the hard work that the coalition has been putting into um, this particular um, body of work, uh, what we also get to see then is sort of some lived experiences and relating in. And so what we're going to do is uh, to kick us off to uh, do a round of introductions, uh, really brief introductions of all of the members here uh, of the panel. Then we're going to hear their reactions to some of those additional uh, storylines uh, while we're having some conversation today. Uh, with that being said, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Jake for a quick introduction. Thanks, Terrell, and, and good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jake McDonald. Uh, I work at an organization, call, an organization called PHI which uh, doesn't stand for anything, so don't uh, bother your brain about that. But we're a national nonprofit, and we're focused on strengthening the direct care workforce. And by that, I mean uh, home health aides, personal care aides, nursing assistants, folks who are providing direct hands-on care. And I work in the policy department at PHI, so my job is to get laws passed at the state and federal level that support direct care workers. Thank you. And our next speaker we'll hear from is Catherine. Hello, everybody. So great to be here. My name is Catherine Martinez. I am here uh, representing the National Association of Community Health Workers. Many of you um, also know us as NACHUA. Um, as a strategic initiatives manager, I put a lot of effort and passion in the visibility and the long-term sustainability of the workforce and the profession. Uh, community health workers is an umbrella term and includes um, community health representatives, promotoras, peers, and other workforce members who are frontline public health professionals. So I'm very excited to be here and really looking forward to the discussion. Beautiful, and thank you. And now we welcome NECA. Sorry about that, I couldn't unmute. Good afternoon, my name is Neka Hall. I am mother of four, 
three who are with me and one who rests in paradise. I am a full spectrum doula turned maternal health advocate turned public health advocate, um, founder of Quietly United and Lost Together and Mother is Supreme Inc. Both orgs support families through any life outcome um, from conception through end of life. And I thank you for being here today. Thank you. And I wanted to say a uh, deep appreciation um, as we sort of um, begin to set the stage. Um, uh, before we move on to the next slide, I just wanna sort of just echo what we heard this morning, the importance of uh, formal caregivers, uh, the role and the ways in which you all show up and work day in and day out providing care to those, um, some of whom are part of our families and some of us uh, who are caretakers of others in our communities um, and in our lives. Um, and what I've learned uh, every time I sort of participate in a caregiver summit or uh, with NATRA, uh, that at some point I was a community health worker and in some ways I still am. Just like I was also at listening to this morning, um, those definitions and I was like, oh, okay, well, uh, I must have also been a caregiver as well, um, but way back when I was a young one, um, coming and navigating uh, a, a life with people who have struggled with addiction for uh, the majority of my ch early childhood, I found myself similarly taking care of my cousins and uh, little ones around me, make sure they got to school, uh, make sure they had food and everything like that. And so I really appreciate these spaces because um, they provide, uh, uh, affirmations and some language to uh, the things that I've experienced and navigated and also to be able to find community. And so from one caregiver uh, to another, I just wanted to say I have deep love and appreciation for everything that you do uh, and we do not take it for granted. And so as we move into the next slide, what I thought was important place to start before we hear from Jake is in some language, right? And I think sometimes uh, we uh, uh, words are overlapping. And so we wanted to just frame this. So when we're talking about uh, community health workers, uh, you might hear some of us uh, talking about that today. Um, CHWs are often talked about as frontline public health workers um, who are trusted members uh, of the communities uh, and usually close to understanding those people who might need us and their, uh, our services. This trusted relationship really allows them to connect, to be in a liaison role, to link, to build community, to serve as an intermediary between the health and the social systems and the community to help facilitate access to important and life critical services, um, to improve our quality of life and the people that we're a part of um, and the communities in which they are operating. When throughout the day, you might hear us talking about direct care workers. And when we're talking about that, we're talking about direct care workers, assisting folks who are older adults and people with disabilities uh, with the daily tasks, such as dressing, bathing, and eating. Personal care aides may also help clients with meal preparation, housekeeping tasks, errands, appointments, employment, and or social engagement. And home health aides um, and nursing assistants perform some clinical tasks, such as wound care, blood pressure readings, and or assistance with a range of motion exercises uh, under the supervision of a licensed professional. And also, um, we're joined by a doula as well, and we have that as a uh, trained birth specialist who offers various culturally sensitive services, which may include ongoing physical, emotional, spiritual, and informational supports the clients and their families before, during, and after childbirth. Doulas help clients prepare for birth, advocate for their wishes, encourage them to take an active role in their pregnancy journey, and assist them with the transition into parenthood. And so I just invite us to take a moment to just kind of take that in. Hmm. And so as we move through the day, we just kind of wanted to offer that, knowing that there might be also other variations of definitions and uh, so forth, but we wanted to at least provide some framework for uh, uh, the, the context that we will be engaging in today. And so earlier we watched uh, the first scenario um, and we wanted to give Jake an opportunity to respond. Jake, please take away, you, you know, um, having watched that vignette, could you talk a little bit about sort of your general reactions 
and any other things that you feel relevant as it relates to caregiver sustainability in action? Yeah, uh, I guess for folks, if, if anyone didn't catch it at the keynote, the domino effect scenario uh, showed really just a fraction of the challenges that family caregivers face when they're trying to balance the demands of their career while also caring for a loved one. And, and for me, the overwhelming thing I think of is how this is just one example of how our entire economy hinges on the labor of care workers who are usually women and for pay, paid caregivers, they're usually people of color and disproportionately immigrants. And without this labor, this care work, everyone's careers and families and in health and our entire economy can't function. And mm -hmm. as a very baseline to my work is an acknowledgement that uh, we need to realize that as a culture and as a society and then begin to appropriately value that labor. And that's just a necessary first step to what uh, PHI and a lot of us here are trying to do. Um, but the scenario also highlights kind of three distinct ideas that I've been working on in, in my role at PHI. And one is how we are struggling in this country to attract and especially to retain home health aides. And it's not an accident in the scenario uh, and in real life that if a home health aide calls in sick, there isn't always someone to replace them. Uh, people call this a, a worker shortage, but really it's a job quality crisis. Mm -hmm. If we were to invest in good quality home health aid positions, we'd be able to attract and keep people in the field. And by job quality, you know, that means compensation, of course. Uh, but it also means, are these workers receiving respect and recognition and good training and supervision? And do they have opportunities to make a career out of it? Um, so the, the second kind of line of thinking I had in response is how this scenario highlights the importance of workplace laws and employer policies like caregiver anti-discrimination protections, paid family and medical leave, paid sick and safe leave and flexible schedules. They're so important to making sure no one has to choose between their own health or a family member's health and their livelihood. And that's true in the scenario for the mother, but it's also true for the home health aide. So the home health aide who wasn't able to come into work, are they losing their job because of that? Or do they have a paid sick day that they can take? Are they able to take off when their child has to stay home from school? Is it their responsibility or the employers to make sure that uh, someone's there for the care recipient when that home health aide is ill? And one thing I see time and time again working with home health aides is that the people who are doing care work often have the hardest time getting care themselves. Mm -hmm. So they have less access to child care to health insurance, to reliable transportation that gets them to work. And yet they're more likely than the average person to be a primary unpaid caregiver in their own family. So again, our paid caregivers are more likely to also be unpaid caregivers as well. Um, and the third kind of line of thinking I had was something I see so much of, but I don't hear from our lawmakers, the people in power which is how the anxiety of how to take care of ourselves and our loved ones, both financially and logistically, takes such an immense toll. And those of us who are caregivers, paid and unpaid, are facing a steep toll on our well-being when there aren't policies in place to support us. And no one is counting the cost of that toll, but it is absolutely immense, um, I think, as, as, th as this crowd knows. Um, so. I finally just wanted to kind of turn those reflections back to our kind of focus uh, during this panel, which is on, on policy efficacy. And at, at PHI, we have a ton of policies we're working on, both at the federal level and at the state level. And I'll really encourage you all to check out our website and I'll, I'll include a link in the chat in just a moment. Um, but on that website, we have lists of federal and state policy recommendations. And everyone here, can educate themselves and they can reach out to their elected officials at the state level 
and at the federal level. And I'll leave my email too. And um, everyone here should feel really comfortable letting me know if you need help getting engaged in, in this work. Um, but at, a, at the core of all those policies that we work on is the idea that we got to make direct care jobs better quality jobs. Thank you so much, Jake, for that. I think um, so many powerful reflections. And one of the things that um, is landing with me and really resonating is um, the relationship between the quality of the jobs and the services um, and the what happens when the people that are giving care and who are so um, loving and caring and supportive also have to carry the burden uh, of that alone uh, without resources, without access to healthcare. Um, and for me, this it just squarely sits as a justice issue and um, a quality of life issue to make sure that everyone has the things that they need in order to be successful and to thrive, especially those um, uh, and it, who give us care and who I think champion and shoulder tremendous burdens so that the society can function. Um, and so as we heard earlier this morning, folks deserve dignity and respect in all that they do. Um, and so I just appreciate um, you making those ties. And so I, as we sort of go and transition um, to see another one of those powerful uh, clips, um, uh, vignettes, if you will, um, I, I wanna sort of pass it over to the team to play the uh, collisions of responsibilities um, slide. And then we'll hear from Catherine when we come back. In The Collision of Responsibilities, a healthcare professional, Michael, debates approving a family caregiver education program, recognizing its value but ultimately rejecting it due to competing priorities. Yet, when Michael unexpectedly becomes a caregiver themselves after a family accident, Michael faces the harsh reality and challenge of inadequate training and support, underscoring the vital necessity of caregiver education and resources in healthcare. This storyline emphasizes that caregiving can be a universal experience that touches everyone at some point in their lives and the importance of adequately preparing and supporting caregivers. Michael is a healthcare professional who works in a hospital setting. He's reviewing a proposal in his office. The proposal outlines the cost of clinical care time to educate family caregivers as part of the discharge phase. This commitment to education would equip caregivers with vital information to support their loved ones as they care for them from home. While Michael recognizes the value of financially supporting the program, he is challenged by competing priorities and questions who should take the responsibility to equip family caregivers for effectively caring for individuals upon discharge. After much debate, Michael and other team members decide that they will not be approving the Family Caregiver Education Program due to the cost of the program. The hospital team overlooks the significant value that a Family Caregiver Education Program could bring to both the patients and the institution. Many patients are being discharged during this time and their family caregivers are supporting them through the process. The caregivers have questions and concerns about how to care for their loved ones. They are clearly nervous. The hospital team assumes things will be taken care of after the patient is discharged. They have what they think is the solution, but it's not helpful enough. Michael leaves the office and goes home, but then he receives an urgent call. His 70-year-old mother has been in a terrible car accident. His brother, who is their mother's primary contact and caregiver, has also been injured in the crash. His mother is hospitalized. His brother is able to come home, but will have a long journey to full recovery, so he needs Michael to take over caregiving duties for their mom. After a few days, Michael's mother is discharged and he takes her home. He now has to juggle caregiving responsibilities with work responsibilities. There's a six-month wait list for a caregiver through home health. Michael has had little training of how to care for his mother in this situation. Michael is overwhelmed with all the paperwork the hospital sent him home with. He begins to realize why caregiver education matters. One late evening a few days after his mom has been discharged, she is not feeling well. She has stomach pains and feels dizzy. Michael is worried and not sure what to do after searching through her discharge paperwork. He looks up her symptoms online and calls care triage lines to determine if an emergency department visit is necessary. 
After several failed attempts to speak with the care provider, Michael takes his mom to the emergency department. In the ED, they learn that these symptoms are common side effects of the medicine she's been prescribed after the accident. This is information that could have been provided by the clinical care team at discharge. There are financial benefits associated with offering education to caregivers. It's well known that readmission rates can be reduced, emergency department visits can be avoided, and people and their loved ones are more satisfied. The likelihood of setbacks post-discharge decreases, ultimately saving the institution and families money in the long run. Roslyn Carter said it best, there are only four kinds of people in the world. Those who have been caregivers, those who are currently caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need a caregiver. Individual call to action. Be or continue to be role models. Through your daily actions, emphasize that caregiving is a precious community resource that we all contribute to and take from throughout our lifespan. Organizational partners call to action. Invest in community-based workforces. This includes, but is not limited to, community health workers, promotoras, doulas, home health aides, and peer support specialists. Legislative call to action. Support legislation that invests in community health workers, promotoras. Examples include change physician fee schedule through CMS and the Community Health Worker Access Act. Wow, thank you. Um, I felt my heart sort of starting to move watching that. Um, and so, uh, Catherine, with the five minutes that you have, I just want to sort of invite you into some reflections, um, sort of what's coming up with, for you as you watch that, and then also adding in sort of from your perspective, um, your unique position. What do you see? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Dara. I would say today has definitely been a day of reflection. And in so many ways, the, what comes up for me is the connection that we all have under this um, umbrella term of all the community health workers, promotoras, the caregivers, you know, we have so much more in common than we actually have at being different. And how can we really build power on that? How can we really bring a focus um, to the space when we talk about how do we be creative and innovative in terms of long-term sustainability for this workforce? And while recognizing that we are all unique, we all diverse, we all come from different walks of life and have different lived experiences, um, we still have the ability to connect, connect with people that are in this workforce and folks that are outside of the workforce that might see themselves as removed, but still very much affected affected as we saw um, in the slides that we just reviewed. So just taking a couple of minutes to really understand, um, you know, at Nashua, we've been campaigning for many years now around unity really talking about the ways that we can come together to deeply understand how um, important it is to build that power. Um, one of the things that I am most proud of, of working at Nachua is being able to represent a workforce that is really rooted in self-determination, self-empowerment. And though lived experiences have the value and, uh, and bring a lot of expertise into this field, it's still this how it's centered around community health workers that are working in communities um, and continuing to, to um bypass all of the different challenges and obstacles they have to be able to render um, this work that is so critical and important. Um, so going above and beyond just acknowledging um, the power, acknowledging the value, really thinking about how do we continue to make this a workforce that will attract new talent, just like Jake said, how can we get more people involved? How can we make sure that we are underscoring the value? And I think we're going to do that through just what we saw on these slides, connecting folks that this is not a, a community health worker um, a oversight. This is not a caregiver only type of focus. This is human. This is the human side of, of everything that we do. Um, we should all be outraged by the lack 
of, of services and investment um, in our workforce. Um, we should all be outraged with the lack of resources available to do this very critical work. Um, and, and that doesn't separate us, that unifies us. So finding more ways and platforms to make those connections, rolling that into actual power with policy and advocacy, bringing awareness and visibility, um, those are all the areas that are really critical at, at this moment. Um, the Community Health Worker Association has, in the last couple of, of years, has been able to really bring a lot of uh, focus especially when it comes to policy and advocacy. The Community Health Workers Access Act is a great example of that, is a great example of legislation that is not perfect, that doesn't solve all, all the issues, but it's, it's starting to move the needle. And I think that starts to empower uh, community health workers and promotoras and community health representatives and caregivers and folks to really understand that even though we do a lot of head down work, where we have the boots on the ground, there is a lot of leadership, there is a lot of advocacy, there is a lot of opportunities right now to really take this momentum and, and move the needle on critical priorities that will preserve the long-term sustainability of, of, of the work that we do and that we love. So I just wanna say that as we're looking to find ways to guide our work, to guide our leadership, to think critically about solutions, let's start by being unified. Let's start by fi finding more ways that we can be more collaborative, that we can um, bring some of these resources together um, and have um, equitable outcomes for, for, all, for everybody. Um, and in the same vein, say we're leading this, right? We don't need somebody else to come and lead us. We can lead. The voices are here. The leaders are, are within this workforce and this profession. Um, and as con we continue to grow in that space, I'm really, really excited about how we're going to transform this workforce. So all that to say, um, I am extremely motivated um, by all of the different stories that we've heard today, by all of you all, everybody who's attending. You guys are all so important and uh, so unique and diverse. Um, and that's something that we should all be collectively very proud of. So. Yeah, thank you so much, Catherine, for that. And I think sort of what's really sticking with me um, and everything that you've shared, uh, power, the power that comes from when we start building intentional and meaningful relationships with one another um, so that we don't feel alone, that we can yeah. share each other's burdens, our joys, our pains, is a deeply fundamentally human lived experience. And what the possibilities are when we actually believe it and really begin to sort of make demands of systems to honor our dignity and our value as human beings um, and to support the work that we know supports other people's ability to do the work um, and to live with dignity. So much appreciation um, for your reflections. Um, and so as we sort of move into our final vignette, um, I'm excited to hear um, uh, NECA talk about and react to sort of this next video, which is called Operation White Coat. Operation White Coat, the Dance for Healthcare Excellence, highlights the importance of doula integration into the clinical care team. Data has proven that doulas are part of the solution in improving health outcomes for Black birthing people. Women with doula care are 58% less likely to experience postpartum depression and anxiety. This storyline shows the barriers that doulas often face in supporting their clients, a lack of understanding and appreciation of their role by the clinical team. We see what is possible when a provider champions the integration of doulas in the care of their patients. Vanessa, a new mother, is waking up in the hospital after giving birth. She's enjoying a quiet moment with her newborn. At the same time, Vanessa's mind swirls with countless questions, overwhelmed by the uncertainties of motherhood. Doulas are part of the solution of improving birth outcomes and increasing the quality of care in the Black maternal health crisis. But Medicaid doesn't cover doulas for the birthing people who need them most. In that moment, Alexis, the doula, reaches out and gently touches her shoulder, offering reassurance with a simple yet profound statement. It's okay, you have help. 
As she recovers, Vanessa begins to feel relieved with support from someone who truly understands what she's going through. Alexis stands by the new mom's side. It's clear she is ready to offer support as Vanessa needs it. The attending physician, Dr. Miller, arrives to the room. He quickly takes charge, minimizing Alexis's presence. He glances at the doula and remarks, we've got it covered. Then he looks at the nurse and says, let's focus on medical matters. This leaves Alexis feeling sidelined and undervalued as a doula, while Vanessa feels uneasy about the situation. Dr. Miller and Alexis confront each other about tensions they're having in their different roles. Later in the evening, Dr. Miller happens to overhear Alexis and Vanessa having an honest conversation about Vanessa's mental health. He begins to understand that they have a connection and it's not just about the numbers on her chart. After she leaves, he sees that Vanessa feels more at ease and her baby is sleeping peacefully. Dr. Miller experiences a transformative moment, witnessing Vanessa and her baby's progress, acknowledging Alexis's invaluable role as the doula. Prompted by this realization, Dr. Miller delves into research on doulas. Dr. Miller reaches a turning point he begins to understand the value that doulas bring to the birthing experience. The newfound understanding sparks advocacy for expanded doula access. For our call to action, we need the individual to share knowledge, talk to friends and families about the roles of doulas during prenatal, birth, and postpartum care, and how doulas drive positive birthing outcomes. For our organizational partners, build a pipeline that easily connects people to doulas. Educate all members of the clinical team on collaborating with doulas and the positive benefits of doulas on the birthing experience. Legislative actions support legislation that invests in the doula workforce and maternal mental health. For example, the Black Maternal Health Momnibus Act, specifically the Perinatal Workforce Act and the Moms Matter Act. Thank you. That, that piece of that touch of reassurance just took me out. I was like, oh, how much of our lives we just need someone to just be there. It's like, I got you. So Neka, I, as you sort of have your five minutes, um, I invite you to react to that. Um, and this next piece I want to ask you, um, one of the things that we talked about in prep um, that I would hope you would give voice to here is sort of those touch points um, and how that might look different. And of course, you can take that however you want to, but just would love to hear and can't wait to hear what you have to say. Thank you so much, Darrell. We have to understand that a doula has much more time with a client than any clinician. We're able to go to their homes as needed. We're able, we're available via phone without having to leave a message. We are able to text on a regular basis, email, um, join them at appointments, et cetera. So we build that foundational um, support and we're able to give them the resources before they get to the labor and delivery room. Mm -hmm. So we saw that this mom was having a very um, hard time during her postpartum phase. Now, had she not had a doula, she would have gone home without the supports needed, mm -hmm. without understanding that you've got this without understanding that you have a host of supports and the ones that are missing 
we can get resources to fill those gaps. During the um, vignette, I heard a statistic um, which spoke to the fact that a lot of people don't have access to doulas, more specifically black and brown people. And one reason, there are so many people who still don't know that doulas exist or what we do. We do not catch babies. I just wanna say that, put that out there. We are there for emotional support. We do slightly massage. We do give resources, but we build relationships. And we're able to build those relationships over time. So whatever outcome, whatever the outcome, whatever the family needs, one thing that I would have done as a postpartum doula is before we got to labor and delivery, I would have set up all of the resources. I would have coordinated care for this client to find out, okay, who's going to be at home with you during that 24-hour phase? When are you going to be able to get rest? We would have been able to establish how much time this person would have been able to take off from work. I would have connected her to a baby cafe, which would have supported her breastfeeding journey so that she would not have had to worry about not being able to feed her baby. Taking little things off of the table. And that's what doulas do. We take off those thing, little things that can become big things and lead to um, postpartum depression, postpartum psychosis, um, and anxiety surrounding this new little person. We allow for our clients to rest. Now, how would I have approached a doctor that did not understand, or how can we collectively approach institutions that do not understand that we are an asset, that we are there to take certain things off of the table. Yes, doula legislation is important. And one of the things that we have to understand is, well, what first and foremost, Massachusetts does, um, we do support Medicaid as doulas, Medicaid. We're paid to support Medicaid clients here in Massachusetts. And I know that there's legislation in other states that will do the same. But our, um, our program is more advanced than most in that we support um, do, doing birth, bereavement, and postpartum. And we're funded to do that through our Medicaid program. And also, you don't, there are several tracks to enter as a doula through the Medicaid process here in Massachusetts. You don't have to have formal training, but you do have to be able to take a test and meet certain standards in order to be allowed to be a Medicaid doula. So that opens the door for so many people who have been caregivers for all of these years to go in and get paid to do the work that others don't. Thank you, thank you so much. I so deeply appreciate that the multiple pathways um, in a system that usually gives us like 15, 20 minutes with a professional, how much more grounding and soothing uh, must it be to feel like I can just reach out, text somebody and they can show up on my behalf or I can ask questions in pre-plan. Um, and even to that last point that you shared that depending when we start accessing and creating legislation that actually works for folks, it creates entryways for people to get compensated um, to provide essential services that are good for the community, which is good for the whole. Um, and so really just deep appreciation um, uh, uh, for you and your insights there as well. And so as we begin, we have about, uh, about 10 or so uh, minutes and we wanted to invite in space for questions from the audience. Um, and so I wanted to just create a little bit of opening if anyone had anything to say, you could drop it in the chat. Um, and we can look there uh, and, all right, let's see if we have anything in the box. And so while we're waiting and someone will have to flag for me because I don't know where that's gonna show up on this box uh, in this screen. Um, I, I was, uh, while we sort of wait for questions to come in. Great, thank you, Megan. 
As we wait for questions to come in, uh, one thing that I'm um, curious about from uh, any of the panelists who want to join, um, I'm, I'm struck by the implications that the uh, workforce is made up of predominantly women and women of color, folks of color um, in this space. Uh, do you, could you talk a little bit about what uh, this means for us as a society and how it relates to doing justice work um, and ensuring better outcomes for, for all of us? Just anyone can uh, jump and answer. I mean, I can start off by saying that for me, it's it's parallel when we think about the two tracks that really need to happen to enhance this workforce and making sure that um, the strides that we're making are really rooted in racial equity and understanding the disparities and just um, how it's not one or the other, it's both. It's and, and really understanding how we can move, find a path to move forward, making sure that we are are taking care of our caregivers and our CHWs in a way that it's also addressing um, the natural challenges that are with uh, doing this work and being really rooted in racial equity. Um, so I think the more we talk about that, we will understand the disparities, we will understand the demographics, we will understand the real need of not only um, long-term sustainability, but also taking care of our people, of our women, of our women of color, um, and making sure that we deeply understand what that should look like. So doing the work in racial equity alongside all of the other uh, priorities that we wanna move forward, I think it's really essential um, to finding a good solution. Thank you, others. Direct care work is one of the biggest professions in the country, and it's 90% women, it's 80% plus people of color, and it's nearly 40% immigrant. And so if in extremely low wages and low compensation, so if we want to address both the racial income and wealth gaps and the gender income and wealth gaps, we can't do that unless we provide adequate compensation to direct care workers, including home health aides. I just wanted to add that it's innate with us, within us to care and within us meaning people of color to care for others. It's, it's, it's ingrained in us because historically that's what we've been doing. We, I was raised by my grandmother to care for her in her old age. And I had the blessing to be with her during her final hours um, in, in home, in the home that she raised me in here. So it does not surprise me that more and more people of color get into the um, home health aid field, get into the community health worker and doula field because, field because that is innate within us from generations of caregiving and knowing that we must take care of our children and we must take care of our elders. It's just a part of the process as you age to take care of those who are behind you. So when we see others who are not being cared for, we automatically jump into XYZ role. I did not become a doula because doulas were getting paid buku bucks. I could have stayed in my old job and made more money than I make now, but I saw the need to become a doula 12 years ago. And that is why I'm here today. Wow, thank you. Thank you all uh, for uh, your wisdom. Uh, and so we have a question uh, that came in. Um, and so anyone, please feel free to, to, to take it. Um, and so someone says, as a program provider, uh, what avenues do you suggest to reach these caregivers? One way you can reach them is that you can use your fingers. Everybody's using Google these days. Depending on what kind of caregiver you're looking for, there's always a coalition, a, um, a, a, a collaborative, there, there are associations that you can go through in order to find the stuff, the group that you're looking for. And there's always a listserv somewhere that'll pop up and, and you can go to that listserv and find whatever caregiver association you're looking for, depending on um, the subset. 
Yeah, I, I double down on that. Also on the uh, NACHO website, we do have those associations listed by state that um, support community health workers and folks that fall under the umbrella term. Uh, so we would encourage folks to visit the website if you want access to it. Um, really, really great directory. It will connect you directly to the folks, but also understanding that in most um, healthcare systems and community-based organizations, um, all, you can find caregivers and community health workers in every single corner. They might have different name titles, but um, you are you're definitely again if you're looking for them, you'll find them um, in these settings. So encouraging folks to to connect with those associations. Um, I know they're always looking for that visibility and the outreach. For, for home health aides, one um, in about a dozen states, there's something called a matching service registry. And this is something we want to see in every single state. And it's a state run website that um, helps home health aides and other direct care workers connect with the families who want to hire them. Mm -hmm. And in addition to doing that, kind of allowing that venue, it also creates this online community of caregivers where the state can put out resources and other opportunities to them. And it also allows home health aides to stack the credentials they get and to show those credentials to the people who would hire them. So if you're a home health aide who gets training in doing um, uh, dementia care, for instance, that, that shows up. You know, you get that credential from the state and people can see that when you're hiring for somebody who has some kind of um, special expertise that you need. Beautiful. And Jake, we have a question for you. And after that question, we're going to uh, wrap up and uh, move us over as we transition out uh, of this particular space. But um, the question for you, Jake, is are there places in the country um, where you see their uh, folks are doing it right um, and anything that we can learn from, uh, nuggets of truth that you could uh, share with us? Yeah, lots of things going on across the country. Um, one thing to look at is on our website, we have a state index where we've actually gone through the caregiver policies of every state, and we actually rank the states according to how good their policies are. So that's one place to look. Um, but maybe a more tangible example that connects paid caregivers to family caregivers is um, Wisconsin has a program called WIS Caregiver, and California has a similar program called Cal Grows, and both of those uh, provide free training and certification to anybody who wants to do home health aid type work. So whether you're a paid caregiver or you're a family caregiver who just, uh, you know, whether you're starting a career or you just need training to like help do help care for a loved one and you need that support, you're able to get that through the state for free. Um, and it's good quality training. And both of those states, I think that's a great model that that we're trying to push in other states as well. Great. Thank you. So I just want to say thank you all so very much for your wisdom, your insights, uh, you being here, um, for offering so much of yourselves to this work, um, to adva advancing um, the cause, to ensure that all of us uh, and the people that uh, provide care and will be giving care at some point in our lives, um, a space to share their voice, their lived experience. Um, and so we want to acknowledge and honor um, you. So thank you so much, Neka, Catherine, and Jake for the time here. Um, and as we all begin to sort of wind down, um, we wanted to sort of create space for a little bit rejuvenation. And so what I'm going to do is pass the mic back over uh, to uh, uh, someone on that side of the house to uh, create a little bit of an opportunity for us to rejuvenate ourselves. And thank you all for coming. And we so appreciate you attending this session. Thank you all. Hi, everyone. Um, we actually are uh, not going to have a rejuvenation exercise for this uh, session, but Taiji, if you can share the screen, I can speak to some of the resources uh, that were highlighted that and how everyone can access those. And while Taiji does that, I will just plug coming up next in uh, starting at, I believe, the 45 mark, uh, we will begin our breakout sessions and we're going to have uh, four minute or we're going to have four different sessions to choose from. They're all really great. And don't worry, 
we are recording all of them. So uh, whichever ones you're not able to catch in this session, you'll be able to catch um, next time around. And so as you can see where we're loading up on the screen here is a list of really awesome resources that have been pulled together by the panelists. A lot of these links are uh, where what the panelists had mentioned in our conversation today. So you can find these under the handout uh, section in this session description. So if you just scroll on down, you'll see handouts and you can download this file that has all of these resources there uh, for you to learn more and continue uh, your own advocacy uh, journey. And then next slide. Awesome. And like I said, uh, in 10 minutes, we're going to have breakout sessions, which are really exciting. Uh, really looking forward to that. So be sure to join us uh, in a little over 10 minutes for that. And before you go, please uh, take just one moment to share your feedback, rate this session. Uh, you can see right under your screen, you'll see the little rate the session button. Uh, we appreciate your feedback. It's very valued. And so please just take one moment to do that. Uh, thank you to our panelists, and we will all see everyone soon.